Darren Kitchen is the founder of Hack5, an internet television show inspiring hackers and IT pros since 2005. Breaking out of the 1990s phone freak scene, Darren has continued to foster his passion for information security throughout his career as a systems administrator, presenter, and creator of best-selling penetration testing tools. So ladies and gentlemen, again, this is another first for me, the first time I've ever introduced someone using the phrase 1990s phone freak scene. Give it up for Darren Kitchen, ladies and gentlemen. Oh man, it is an absolute pleasure to be here, guys, let me tell you. This is gonna be a lot of fun. We are going to talk about the curse of convenience. And I'm gonna ask the question, would you believe me if I told you that your grandmother might be responsible for the propagation of the world's first cyber weapon, and that she may in fact usher in a new era of privacy and security? This is a talk about lies, it's a talk about trust, it's a talk about convenience, and your grandmother, as well as duckies, turtles, and pineapples. And this is something that I've been noodling on for some time. I've been asking myself the question that in a culture of convenience, can we strike a balance for, between the need for security and the need for simplicity? So uh, just a show of hands, who here is familiar with Hack5? Oh, fantastic. Okay, so uh, that's where I come from. I'm the founder of Hack5. It's a show on Discovery Digital. And since 2005, we've been inspiring hackers and IT pros. Before Hack5, I did my due diligence as a systems administrator. I did the IT thing. Yes, I was a 1990s phone freak. I don't know if that was a thing here in Australia. Did you guys use blue boxes and red boxes to get free long distance? Okay, well. In this scene, it was all about building these boxes, these tools of convenience, these devices that would violate the trust built into the telephone system so that you could call Venezuela for free. And for the last decade, I've had the absolute honor to be able to continue that spirit in both Hacker Media doing my podcast, Hack5, as well as to continue to build these boxes, these physical manifestations of these hacks, these simple InfoSec tools that violate these implicit trusts with usually very simple lies. And I've learned over time that these conveniences are an absolute curse, but they may in fact be our salvation. Everybody here has done tech support for their parents or grandparents, right? Just making sure I'm in the right room. So I have a few stories to tell you and we're going to start with Stuxnet. Stuxnet was the world's first known cyber weapon. Uh, unlike Heartbleed or Poodle or Shellshock, it didn't have a really cool logo. But what it did have was the ability to take down Iran's nuclear program. It's a very targeted worm. So just so we have some background, nuclear power, nuclear Weapons, kind of difficult to make. They require something pretty unique. They require enriched uranium. And uranium is composed primarily of this U-238 stuff, which isn't fissile. That means there's not going to be any nuclear fission. Less than 1% of it is U-235. That's the stuff that goes boom. That's the stuff that will do that, that nuclear fission chain reaction. So if you want to do something useful with uranium, you have to enrich it. If you're trying to make some nuclear power with it, somewhere around 4% will do. If you're trying to make somebody have a very bad day, the weapons grade stuff takes about 90%. And so to create this stuff, the most common way is to use a centrifuge. It's, it's a device that will help separate that 235 from the 238. It's a big cylinder, it spins the stuff, centripetal force will push the heavier 238 to the outside, 235 stays on the inside, Bob's your uncle. And to control this specialized piece of equipment, 
you need some special hardware. You need a PLC. This is a programmable logic computer. It's just a very specialized piece of industrial automation equipment. You'll find similar stuff in automotive factories. And in the case of Stuxnet, this particular unit is from Siemens running Step 7 software. And this was what was specifically targeted by Stuxnet. And it did a fairly good job at making a bad day for the Iran nuclear program. It ended up doing some damage to some 20% of these centrifuges. So here's the thing. Nobody's really taken responsibility for Stuxnet. I mean, there have been many coy acknowledgments from senior US officials, specifically Hillary Clinton. But when all of this came to light in 2010 and 2011, there's never been somebody being like, I'm behind Stuxnet. Now it's 2016, it's, it's pretty obvious that this was actually a joint Israeli and US effort. But I know in my heart that there was another party that was involved in this that has been more influential in information security than any nation state actor. That's grandma. This is grandma. She is awesome. She bakes cookies. She has a book club. She yells at the TV. She plays bridge. And she is about to get on the World Wide Web. We're going to come back to Stuxnet, but real quick, let's go back to 1997, because Grandma just got her first home PC. She got herself an IBM PC 330. That thing is sweet. It's got a Pentium MMX processor in it. It's got CD-ROMs. She's going to be checking out Encyclopedia on CD-ROM. She's going to be scanning in photos. She's going to email her book club on the information superhighway. This is fantastic stuff. Everything was going perfect. Until, of course, it came to the printer. <laughs> this is where things go awry. Because Grandma had gotten everything set up, and everything's going swimmingly, until, of course, she's plugging in the printer, getting the power going, plugging in that LPT cable. Everything seems kind of obvious. You can't plug a parallel port into a serial port. It just doesn't work. Until, of course, it gets to setting up the drivers. She goes to put the little plastic thing in the cup holder. And she's looking at the disk. And it says, click start, click run, type d colon backslash setup.exe, where d is the letter of your CD-ROM. What? How are we going to print the newsletters for the grandchildren now? Everything is ruined. Call NORAD. We have a problem. The honeymoon is over. We are about to lose grandma. Actually, what's about to happen is she's about to call her grandson for some tech support. We've all been there. On the phone for a half an hour, walking through a driver installation, just praying and wishing, oh dear God, if only I had a remote desktop session. You know you've been there. <laughs> but that didn't happen in this case. It was actually kind of brilliant. Microsoft did us a solid. This was the late 90s. Computers were going mainstream. Everything was becoming user friendly. Everything was becoming plug and play. So when Dr Grandma popped the CD in the drive and the computer read it, well, she got a nice little wizard. It was really just a matter of clicking next, next, finish. Well, that's fantastic. How did that happen? Well, it's Windows 95. Everything needs to be made for convenience, I'm trying to make these consumer devices now. So what'll happen is the operating system is going to check the CD-ROM and see if on the root of the drive there's a little file called autorun.inf, sort of similar to your auto exec bat on a floppy. And so the operating system is just going to trust the CD-ROM, and it's just going to execute whatever's in this file. And this behavior would continue on through Windows XP. I know I learned to take advantage of this inherent trust. That's a USB drive. But not just any, that's a fancy one. That's one from SanDisk called the Cruiser. I like to call it the Switchblade. 
It sounds cool, it sounds lethal, it's got that sliding action. And the way that this drive worked, similar to many other USB drives, is that as soon as you plug it into the computer, it's gonna do this fancy little handshake. It's gonna say to the computer, hello, computer. I'm a mass storage device. It hands over this descriptor, as it were, and it says, I'd like to be your friend. And of course, this new wonderful USB specification in the late 90s, we have these descriptors, and the computer says, fantastic. Mass storage? I know how to work with you. Let's do this. And so, drive letter pops up, everything is happy. Well, this SanDisk did something extra special. In addition to saying, well, good afternoon, computer. I am a mass storage drive, and I would like to be your friend. It also would say, I am also a USB CD-ROM drive. And the computer, of course, is like, ooh, a CD-ROM drive? Oh, you don't happen to have one of those auto-run to INF files, do you? You can see where this is going. SanDisk saw this as an opportunity to make this drive automatically pop up whatever applications they want. They sold this with portable apps. They took advantage of that trust, and they used it to make a very convenient product. They bundled it with Skype. They bundled it with Opera. They had this cool little launcher. You know, to add insult to injury, they put a vast antivirus on here, which I kind of find hilarious. And so what we did was we said, huh, well, that's really convenient. What if we remove those portable apps? What if we replace them with our own penetration testing tools? So rather than Skype and, and Opera, we have payloads that uh, steal password hashes off of the computer, or install backdoors, or exfiltrate data off the documents folder. I like to call that an involuntary backup. <laughs> it's important that you back up your files. If you take nothing else from this talk, back up your files. If you don't, a hacker may for you. And this was fantastic. Microsoft eventually got wise to this issue. There was a pretty cool white paper about it and such. And it's not present in Vista and above. You have this little dialogue you have to go through some clicks. So this was actually only a viable attack vector for, I don't know, a little over a decade. <laughs> Which brings me to tell you a story about grandma's grandson and a rubber ducky. You see, I paid my dues. I worked in IT in the early 2000s. I was a systems administrator. And like many systems administrator, I had one goal, and that was automate my job so I can play Counter-Strike. <laughs> and I got pretty good at that, mainly because I found myself doing very similar tasks over and over, the support requests for things like, I lost connection to the intranet, or I can't get on the share drive, or what's up with the printer down the hallway? And so I found that the quickest solution to many of these problems was always to just open up a terminal and you know, bang out a few commands in the prompt. Well, I was using the USB switchblade for that automation to just fix computers because I could just plug in a drive and be like, there we go, we're done. But of course, that was no longer a viable option. So with the switchblade not really a good attack vector anymore, I thought to myself, well, if all I really need to do is just lean over and type into someone's keyboard for a while, what if I could automate me? What if I could become a robot? If all I need to do is grab a keyboard and type a few commands, well, remember that USB descriptor, that little bit in the enumeration of the handshake of that USB device that says, hello, computer, I am mass storage. I'm a CD-ROM. Well, it turns out, with the right microcontroller, it's pretty trivial to just say, hi there, I'm a keyboard. Let's be best friends. Which is pretty cool, because computers trust keyboards. They do, because they trust humans. The majority of our human input to a computer is over keyboards. There's, in fact, a specification for humans in USB. It's called the HID, or the Human Interface Device. 
And it is a perfect example of that relationship between man and machine, that trust and that convenience and that ubiquity. And I would expect this relationship to continue until, of course, Skynet, or the singularity. <laughs> but what if we were to lie? What if we were to tell the computer our microcontroller was to say, hey, I'm a keyboard, and then start typing keystrokes as if it were flesh and blood? It would then violate this inherent trust between us. And at that point, all bets are off. So that's what happened. I developed the USB rubber ducky. I developed this to automate IT tasks, like fixing printers. And what's beautiful about this is, as opposed to the USB switchblade, as opposed to taking advantage of an inherent trust built into one operating system having to do with CD-ROM drives, we're taking advantage of a much lower level trust between machine and man. So, it's OS agnostic. It doesn't care if you're a Windows or a Mac or a Linux or an Amiga. As long as the computer supports HID, this beautiful specification that was built into USB to support keyboards and mice and joysticks and many other devices without the need for any drivers so that you would just plug it in and it would just work and it would be user friendly, it would be plug and play. HID is amazing, HID is convenient. It is ubiquitous. It is unauthenticated. And so you get to the point where, well, if you can't trust your users, who can you trust? There was a, uh, a recent audit of a company's policy against foreign USB drives. Funny how that happens, suddenly switchblades and everything, and nobody wants USB drives in their corporations. And so you guys know what happens when on a Windows host, you hit Windows, you hold down Windows key, you hit R, and in the run line, you type in backslash, backslash an IP address. Goes to mount a Samba share. Like grabbing a network drive. And part of that initiation to that server somewhere is to tell it, hi, I'm this workstation logged in as this user. So this major bank drops all of these USB rubber duckies. And as you can see, it looks like a thumb drive. It smells like a thumb drive. It's not a thumb drive. When you plug this into the computer, it enumerates as a keyboard and starts typing at over 9,000 characters per minute. And so it's, it's trivial. It's only a moment before it's pulled up just the run line and hit that one liner and enter. And then suddenly a very well-crafted server somewhere is logging the workstation, the time, and the user that violated that policy. This is actually a screenshot from Mr. Robot uh, where they used this tool. That's kind of cool. Another really fun one with this is this 2K reverse shell. This is really cool. You can plug it into a host and just have it type whatever you want. And in this case, what we're typing is a base 64 encoded reverse shell. And what's brilliant about this is it's not downloading a payload from over the internet. It's not copying it from mass storage, which may be in violation of some group policy. It's like typing the program into the computer as if I were 13 again, writing basic into my IBM PC from a magazine from the library. And yet, unlike 13-year-old me, it was doing that at superhuman speeds, never having a typo, never taking a break, Never missed a semicolon, which is kind of awesome because then we get a reverse shell in like 30 seconds on this machine. Another really fun one, again, because it's OS agnostic, is we plug it into, say, an Android phone. And of course, the Android device, any modern operating system these days is like, cool, USB hid, you must be a human. Yeah, let's start typing. Oh, hey, hang on, though. I've, I got a lock screen, so we're not going anywhere anytime soon. Oh, unless, of course, you want to type in the pin code, in which case, go for it. So a payload that will just type 0000, 0, 0, 0 through 9999 becomes absolutely trivial until, of course, you realize that Android thought ahead. I know. Every five attempts, 
they make you wait 30 seconds. And so there's the possibility that you could literally watch this phone until it says, excuse me, you've mistyped your password over 9,000 times, you're going to have to wait 30 seconds. <laughs> I know, it's, it doesn't ever self-destruct. I, I can only imagine that the FBI must love Android as opposed to some other vendors. I was once on the phone with the, uh, with the sheriff's office in the United States, and I'm walking him through setting up this payload. It's really fun because it generates itself with Bash and a bunch of set and awk and grep and stuff. And so um, he's, he's got it deployed in the rubber ducky, and he's got it plugged in to this Android phone from the suspect. And he's, he's asking me, he's like, all right, so got the payload there. I'm like, uh-huh. Got it plugged into the, to the phone. Uh-huh. It's typing. Uh-huh. What do I do now? But here's the thing. With those 30-second timeouts, to exhaust the entire key space, it's going to take 16 hours. The pin code is 0001. It's going to be no time flat. But if it's 9999, you might be there for a while. So I'm like, Sheriff, it's time to deputize someone. And so all of this works because of convenience. When inherent trusts are baked into a system for the sake of convenience, it only takes the right lie to completely compromise the security. And yet at the same time, this is the stuff that is going to make grandma's life easier. Grandma, she's huge. She's on the Snapchat, she's on the Facebook, on the Instagram, on the Twitter, on Bebo, whatever that is. And she's got the latest smartphones, the latest tablets. She is hip. She is cool. She is tech savvy. She's also pretty well off, retired, and likes to travel. So she stays at the Hilton. She stays at the Marriott. She flies Virgin and United. She drinks coffee at Starbucks and Kaleidoscope. And when she goes to her coffee joint, she expects her devices to automatically connect to the Wi-Fi. I recently saw a t-shirt with this. You guys have no idea how happy this makes me. <laughs> because wherever grandma's going, all of her devices are sending out these little probes. And they're saying, hey, is H Honors around? Is Marriott around? Is GoGo InFlight around? Is Starbucks around? And when it sees one of those, it connects. And when it connects, if there's a captive portal, one of those things where it you know, pops up and you typically have to uh, accept a license agreement or acceptable use policy or maybe make a payment or in the case of many hotels, uh, especially in Vegas if you go to DEF CON, they will ask for your last name and your room number, which by the way is awesome because all you have to do is put in kitchen and then try every single possible number and then bill things to my room. Don't do that at DEF CON. So, Wherever she goes, her phone automatically connects, and these captive portals just automatically pop up for convenience. Because again, we want computers to be toasters. We want them to be convenient. We want it all automatic and plug and play. We don't want mission control. We want a little appliance that does the thing. So any modern OS is going to pop up these captive portals, any modern OS is going to automatically connect to these remembered networks because we don't want to inconvenience the user. In fact, here at the Marriott, this was in my room, it literally says, after you've connected to the Marriott wireless network, that the hotel landing page will automatically open because that is the default on all modern operating systems. How fantastic is that? They even have like a caveat here if you're running an older OS that you need to open a browser and just go to any page. It really doesn't matter what page because the captive portal will grab you. This is fantastic because the network operator can push you to any web page they want, hosting any iframe with a PDF or whatever have you. And so this is the kind of convenience, this is the kind of trust that we violate with a Wi-Fi pineapple. I'm wearing one right here, it's quite fashionable. <laughs> what the Wi-Fi pineapple does, among many other things, is it sees these probe requests coming out of, out of your phone, your tablet, your, your laptop, saying, hey, 
is XYZ network around? And like the mirror in Harry Potter, it shows you what you want to see, and it says, yes, I am XYZ network. Come and join. And then it continues to advertise that and does very wicked things with uh, manipulating frames. So in addition to gathering some passive intelligence about the fact that, that grandma drinks coffee at Kaleidoscope or that she's stayed at the Marriott Surfers Paradise, we collect grandma as a client. She joins our network, which then puts us as the penetration tester, specifically poised as the man in the middle, which means that much like your home ISP, much like any network that you've ever connected to, the operator is sitting in the middle and has that ability to monitor the traffic, to manipulate the traffic. We could replace all of the photos on the internet with cats. We could turn all web pages upside down. Seriously, look up upside down internet, it's fantastic. Or we could pop up a captive portal of our own and start harvesting corporate credentials. All of this for convenience. Because Wi-Fi is ubiquitous. And because all it takes is a simple lie to go ahead and violate that inherent man-machine trust. And yet it is what is making life so convenient for grandma. A little word on Wi-Fi pineapple. This is the, uh, the first ever generation Wi-Fi pineapple. And um, I know that a bunch of you guys were able to come out to our workshop on Monday and, and got yourselves some. Uh, thankfully, you didn't get the Mark I version, because if you did, I would tell you, when you go through airport security with one of these, <laughs> as I did, you may end up in a situation where the, the security agent says, um, excuse me, what is this? I was so caught off guard. I was like, uh, it's my novelty router. They make them in coconut, too. Oh, that's so cute. You're going to have to take it out of your bag next time. It looks like a grenade in the x-ray. <laughs> Oops. They don't look like that anymore. They look like this now. You know, speaking of hardware, though, let's talk about grandma's laptop. I told you she is a techie. She has got the sweetest little machines, i7, 4K display, weighs less than a kilogram. The thing is beast. Only one problem, no ethernet port. This is a big problem too, because grandma's a gamer. She is killing it in Dota 2. She is climbing ladders in Call of Duty and Counter-Strike Go, and you don't need me to tell you that lag is the enemy. Don't get me wrong, Wi-Fi is great, I love Wi-Fi. But wired is better. And so what she's going to need to do is just go out and grab a USB Ethernet adapter. We all have one of these kicking around the office. Here's one. It even says USB Ethernet adapter on the back. These things are becoming commonplace. I would use these as a sysadmin when machines would die. Like I would have a dead nick. And rather than open up a box and replace a PCI card, it's just often more convenient to just go ahead and plug in an inexpensive USB Ethernet adapter and move on with my day. I actually had my dad once ask me when I was getting my a certification if I was learning to solder chips onto the PCB. I'm like, no, dad, we don't do that. If something's broken, you just replace it. That's, that's the society we're in, you know? It's, we're a culture of convenience. So while Ethernet may be fading because machines are getting lighter and smaller, these are becoming more and more ubiquitous. And so as you imagine, this USB Ethernet adapter, well, it smells like one and looks like one. Well, it actually is one. It is a USB Ethernet adapter as well as so much more. There's an embedded Linux distribution on here, a little sock, and it allows us to do remote access into networks. It allows us to do Man in the middle fun. We call it the land turtle because getting shells is fun. I know, you can kick me off the stage at any point. But it looks like the real thing. And I don't think Ethernet is going away anytime soon. And so we end up with this, which means that I can drop it at any client site. And as long as it's powered over USB, I have remote access into that network. I really wish I had one of these when I was a sysadmin. 
because I was managing multiple client sites, and this would have just been beautiful. That said, as a penetration tester, this is just as beautiful, because that's not leaving the network closet anytime soon. There's another way to deploy it that's actually kind of fun. Remember those USB descriptors? Hi, I'm a CD-ROM drive. I'm a mass storage. I'm a keyboard. Let's be friends. There's another really cool one. It's called CDC Ether, or RNDIS. And what it basically means is, hey, computer, I'm an Ethernet Nick. Let's be friends. And of course, computers are like, oh, Ethernet. I love Ethernet. That's fantastic. Let's. And what's the first thing they try to do when they connect to a network? It's for convenience. DHCP. Hey there, turtle, USB Ethernet adapter. Can I get an IP address? And of course, the land turtle is like, oh, fantastic, an IP address. Yes, we have a fine selection. In fact, I'd like to introduce you to our DNS servers. <laughs> it is the physical man in the middle. It allows us to, much like the Wi-Fi pineapple over Ethernet, monitor and manipulate traffic. DNS poisoning really couldn't be any easier. And so all of this, again, exists for convenience. We want it to just work. In fact, when you plug this guy in, it's just going to automatically install drivers. It's going to automatically get an address from DHCP. And yet, all it takes is a little lie. And I feel like, in many ways, we have grandma to thank for this. Because computers need to be user friendly. They need to be plug and play. So remember the centrifuges, spinning away, enriching that uranium with those programmable logic controllers that Stuxnet attacked. Stuxnet targeted specifically and said, hey, they actually, they were pretty effective, you know, doing damage to nearly a fifth of the, these centrifuges. And these aren't easy to replace. This is, in fact, old Soviet stock. And so you're wondering, like, well, how, did, how is that possible? Because, of course, these aren't you know, connected to the internet. This isn't Internet of Things. This isn't an Amazon Echo. You can't say, Alexa, order enriched uranium. Let me try that once more. Alexa, order enriched uranium. OK, I just want to make sure that I get the uh, listeners at home on a watch list. <laughs> because, of course, these things are air-gapped. Right? So how do you get information onto an air-gapped PC? I mean, it sounds secure. No, it's not connected to a network. So you've got to ferry data to it somehow. We've got to push those updates. We've got to tell it you know, some programming what to do. And of course, these expensive PLCs are being run by boring Windows boxes. So how were they infected? Well, it propagated over USB. It's actually a really cool worm. It employed several awesome zero-day vulnerabilities, including a really cool LNK vulnerability. It, it, was, it was pretty awesome. But it, it did so over USB, because it's understood that convenience is king. You know, network operators, systems administrators, if we don't have a network, we're going to sneaker net that thing. <laughs> but then it begs the question, all right, well, then how did the centrifuges destroy themselves? And they did so by being induced to spin in such a way that they would literally tear themselves apart. Which is kind of crazy to think, because, all right, I'm a worm. I'm telling this piece of equipment to just spin to its death. You'd figure a network operator would kind of like notice that. But they didn't. The operators of this these equipment, the operators managing these PLCs of these centrifuges enriching this uranium, didn't notice that they were being spun to their death because of a simple lie. Because the worm told the centrifuge to go die and told the operators that everything's A-OK. -okay. Which is kind of fantastic. I think it illustrates the point that we live in a culture of convenience. We are willing to trade almost anything for convenience. We'll trade money. We'll trade quality. We'll trade security. I mean, ransomware, right? A lot of times, it's easier to just pay up. And in fact, if you need to pay up, there might even be a support line there willing and able to help you transfer your money into Bitcoin. 
or streaming audio. This is by no way as good as CD or vinyl. But it's on demand. It's convenient. Much the same way that we're willing to binge on TV shows and movies with often terrible bit rates, rather than buying the Blu-ray, which is obviously much higher quality, but we don't because it's less convenient. And yet we still end up with this. That's OK. I hear that you guys get a lot more of that, too. Security is hard. It really is. So let's, let's just go shopping. In Christopher's keynote yesterday, a question was poised about who has, in the last week, used encrypted email. And there were very few hands in the audience. I know, because encryption is hard. PGP is not convenient. If you would like to email me about this afterwards, go to keybase.io slash Darren Kitchen. You'll find my PGP key. That said, I, very, I receive very few of these. So with security not being convenient, I'm wondering, though, is grandma onto something? Right? Is convenience actually a curse? Or can convenience, in fact, be our salvation? I'll give a very similar example to uh, yesterday. WhatsApp, implementing the Signal protocol, end-to-end -end encryption for a billion users, uh, users that have never thought twice about key exchange or fingerprint validation, or iPhone users with iMessage within certain caveats, a couple million people, using end-to-end -end encryption. And the thing about this, though, is this is what grandma's already using. It gets better for us sysadmins. SSL certificates, so much fun to install, right? OK, it's gotten so much better. Let's Encrypt, an initiative backed by the likes of Akamai and Mozilla and EFF, providing free certificates that install in just seconds with a couple of commands. And so sites that wouldn't have otherwise implemented security now have security because it's convenient. You know, it's, it's these intersections that are so interesting. It's these, just like in ecologies, where you have the intersections of land and sea where things get really interesting. I feel like where security meets convenience, things get really interesting. Now, I'm not telling you guys to trust every sketchy looking USB Ethernet adapter or shady Wi Fi out there. But I, I do believe that we should trust that if security is default and if security is convenient, not only are we going to be living in a culture of convenience, we're going to be living in a culture of security. Thank you. Wonderful stuff, Darren. We've got time for a couple of questions. Throw any questions on the conference app now if you want to ask them. A um, couple of questions. One that has already come through. There was that shot there of the, uh, there was a high heel shoe with a love tattoo on the inside. Someone asked, was that your foot? <laughs> yes. There you go. No, absolutely, that's me. Now, you can find out later. Just got to enumerate all of the hotel room numbers and put in kitchen and see which one I'm at. No, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> Your personal, we talk, Chris was talking, Chris Sagoyan was asked this question as well yesterday about his own personal protection regime. And we spoke, you mentioned about iMessage, WhatsApp, etc. Uh, did you hear his presentation? What did you take from that? And what's your own personal protection regime? I think it's fantastic that more and more technologies are becoming ubiquitous for security and privacy. Uh, WhatsApp and iMessage are interesting pushes in those right directions as we find the the clash between governments and corporations, the citizens and the users, and the fight to protect those users. So I think it's fantastic that those technologies have end-to-end, -end, but again, they're those silos. I, I'm a huge fan of PGP just because it's an open specification. But that said, so is Signal, and that's the protocol that's been implemented by WhatsApp. And so I say, all right, if that's not your jam, and you just want to use you know, text, uh, Signal, the actual application whose specification was you know, the, the founder of this, the, use that. Formerly text secure, now signal, cross-platform. Right, fantastic stuff. We are going to see Darren later in the uh, great speed debate tomorrow afternoon as well, when he'll give us his opinions on four different subjects, one minute each. Give him a round of applause. Great stuff, Darren. Thank you very much. Thank you. From Hack5.
Great stuff, mate. Now we're going to give you a... Oh, I don't know. As you leave, you're going to be given a lovely gift. Um, I wanted to explain the gifts that we're giving out today uh, are quite beautiful. You'll see the ones our speakers yesterday and today got. They're these... Uh, they're a, a macadam... They're a, bo a little bowl. There's a, there's a Queensland-based company that makes product macadamia uh, nut products, and they've ma manufactured these beautiful little bowls out of macadamia shells. And it's a gorgeous story because this is a company that were big floods in Queensland recently. These guys were almost completely wiped out. They're an international design. When they've, they've won Nordic design competition. So when you start winning the Nordic ones, that's when you know you're doing pretty well. So you're going to get one of those, um, as all our speakers do. So one more round of applause for Darren. Thank you very much, mate. Great stuff. Thank you. Wonderful.